Hello, y'all. How y'all doing? This is uh, Black Push here. We have Sean, our CEO. We have Darren. I am the digital media specialist. We have our special guest, Tenor. And we also have Ari, our outreach manager. And um, we just want to first thank Disco Radio for allowing us to be in this space today. Hey, so welcome back, everybody, this week. We're going to shift our show around just a little bit. Um, first off, I want to give a shout out to everybody on the right side. This is my right side today. So we're going to get a shout out to Ari. Who is our um, community outreach representative? She does a lot of work for us in the community, reaching out to different churches. And to Nora, who has decided just to join in on this, because as you guys know, um, we have not spent a lot of time, I don't think, Darren, talking about what Black Push is, what Newbie Corp is. Um, we are at the base of who we are, um, Christian base. And there was a conversation that came up in my house yesterday that I was like, you know what? I'm going to kick the podcast off with that, even though we will have some other special guests throughout. But the big discussion is, Adam and Eve, <laughs> like wrong. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve. And they had such a valued opinion in the office. I was like, you know what? Let's save it for the podcast because we agree to kind of disagree. And I know Disco, you're going to be on our side today on this one, right? Absolutely, right? When he gets this mic on, he's going to be on our side on this. So we, we good. <laughs> Disco. Well, we'll see because I may even bring Disco in on this one, this first part of the conversation. So Ari, who was wrong? Adam or was it with Eve? Say, and you got your little side, you got your little, <laughs> um, your side energy over here. So, my position is that they were both wrong. Um, but I think their story was the first story of choices, making choices, and mm -hmm. accountability. Ooh. Um, I think they were both in the wrong just because they were both presented with the same choice. Hey, God said, hey, I've created this whole world for you. It's nice and new, brand new. You can name whatever you want to name, do whatever you want to do. But there's this one tree that you can't touch. It's about, you know, are you going to have, is it going to be representing good and evil? Those are your two choices. So though them both receiving the same instructions, he went out was easily tempted by a serpent that she'd never even, you know, encountered before. And she took his word over her creators. That was number one choice. And she went back, presented, even with the choice that the serpent gave her, said, hey, your eyes are going to be opened. Um, you're going to, God is keeping this from you. She just took it and, and ran with it and brought it back to her, the person that was created, um, she was created from, which was Adam, and him knowing what God told him, he still accepted what she gave him anyway, didn't question it or anything. And so he made his choice to take it without question and even when their eyes were open and they saw that they were, you know, God said they, um, they noticed that they were naked and they, you know, made clothes for themselves, et cetera. And when God saw them, like, why would you, why are you clothed now? And, you know, she admitted what she did, but she didn't, she immediately pointed to somebody else, pointed the blame to, oh, the serpent told me, you know, this and that. So at what point did she take accountability for her action, for her choice that she made, which ruined us all <laughs> in a sense, <laughs> but it was the most important choice that, and I say we as humans, but, you know, her being the seed, uh, her and Adam being the seed of, you know, humanity to make that choice that determined the fate for everybody after them. So that's my standpoint. So interestingly enough, right? Um, before we get started on our side, we, we're mm -hmm. going to be gentlemen on this side, and we're going to let you, Tenori, jump in on this. Give us your opinion <laughs> as well. Um, well, I agree with... Go ahead. We got you. Okay. I agree with everything that um, Ari said. Accountability, um, choice, but also obedience, what it looks like not to obey God. Um, I do think that... Adam carried the bulk of the issues or where we went wrong. Um, Eve, she, she, she played a part, but 
as women, we're created to be a helpmate, and the man is supposed to cover us. So she went by herself with the serpent, but where is her covering? Darren. Awesome. I'm curious to know your opinion on this. <laughs> we're on air. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would say uh, both are to blame equally. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to be by myself today. So, uh, and I think just from how the story goes, you know, I'm not a Bible bumper, but I have read it a few times. And um, the serpent got punished first. So I feel like uh, God kind of weighed in on him more. The serpent being, you know, it could be in human form. It could have been in spiritual form. Um, <clears throat> But it got punished first. So I feel like the serpent probably weighed in and probably had the bulk of the the punishment first and then everybody else got their punishment in regards and i mean we can say i guess we could deem whose punishment's worse you know men working women having to deal with with you know or so i i wouldn't you're personally want to be like you have kids you're i know right like, no, <laughs> she I made a face people, though i see a lot of <laughs> so that. yeah um but what y'all go through is it's beautiful too but um yeah definitely i guess you can weigh it in on that yeah, I, I guess I don't know. Um, weirdly enough, once again, the reason why we're even having this discussion is I think that <laughs> it kind of goes deeper, and I think that you kind of hit on two different things that kind of stuck out to me today that I never really realized that it goes to accountability. Um, and in a lot of things that we do here at Black Push, even with Newbie Corp, right? It stands for accountability. Like there's been things that we have stood up for per se that um, the public don't really agree with our opinion on. But once again, right is right and wrong is wrong, right? So when I think about the situation of Adam and Eve per se, um, I know that the Bible, God gave the commandment to Adam first. He really did. He told him that you can do of anything you want to do in the, in the garden, but just don't touch this tree, right? Um, that was something he told to Adam. We don't know if Eve was there when he told that to Adam. Um, that part we don't know, right? Because mm -hmm. we know that he put Eve to sleep, I mean, Adam to sleep, and then he created Eve at some point. Um, Adam being Eve's covering, he should have gave her every commandment that God had given him, period, at the end of the day, because if we're going to be a family, um, if God is going to give me one thing, it's my obligation as the man to share that with the family, right? And we can have a debate about later on, does God speak to the woman? Does God give insight to the woman? Yes, we know that throughout the Bible, but this was like the beginning foundation of it all. Um, I still feel like, my personal belief, I, t I think Adam <laughs> told him, told her. Right, because there was a part where Eve even said, you know, where God told us to eat of every tree, but not this tree. So that means that there had to be some kind of dialogue, some kind of conversation there. Um, and she was just still, you know, she was caught up in the moment. She was tricked. But at the same time, you guys said something important. Adam was supposed to be her covering. And the question that we can all ask ourselves is, where the heck was Adam? Right? Mm -hmm. um, how, and <laughs> it's funny because you guys kind of brought this to my attention today when we were walking to the restaurant. And you guys are like, well, you know, the man is supposed to be on the outside. You know, if a car jumped the road. going to hit both of y'all anyway. Uh, right. But they, but you know, in their opinion, they say that the man is supposed to be on the other side. Hit and don't hit her. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, kick her out the way. push her out the way. Yeah, how about you kick her out the way? There you yeah, go. Okay. But I mean, so, I mean, that goes back to the whole aspect of covering, right? Where was the man? Why was he not there? Um, what is it that he could have done differently? So, you I just said he was, she, um, I believe, she said he was there. Okay. I believe, like... I got two women in here, but it's all good. Women are hard-headed regardless. Mm. So I believe they had a debate and an argument about the whole situation. And he got fed up and couldn't take no more and just let her do what she's going to do. Period. So he ate it because she was like, she's <laughs> getting on his nerves. Whatever. And there was no solution to it. And they say- Because women are very powerful alpha women. And that's who they are. And we can tell them all day long what not to do. And what they shouldn't do, but because it came from a man, we're going to do it. Anyway, so I think Buddy just got fed up. So you know what? So have it. There it is. There. He they might have. He might have been out hunting. Who knows? He might have been gathering food. Working. That's why what his job was. What his job was. You know, it but could be so many reasons. Him saying like, yeah, Adam had a something. choice too. He had a choice to not take it. Exactly. Yeah, I say it's both people. Yeah, the commandment was given better. to Adam. The command was given to him, so he knew better. Uh, and the only thing, if we're talking about like biblically, who's correct? I mean, you know, obviously it was Eve's fault. If you're going off the Bible alone, because the Bible states that with sin came into the world through Eve. So if you're doing biblical, but if we're doing ethical, I would say both people. And I don't even snap, but I'm going to so, snap. Well, on that I, one. I, I'm with that too because he should have he should have been making sure she didn't do it. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah. He should have been that. I'm, I'm the captain of the ship. I'm the man of the house. 
because her role was to help follow lead. him. Yeah. That's what she was created for. The woman was created to help. She was fit for that man. Mm-hmm. He was, she was created to help him. That was her purpose. Everything in that land had a purpose. Everything, including yeah. her. True. Hmm. That is so true. So you don't think they believed in each other? Is what it was? I bet they did not it have had to be a breakdown or have that mm-hmm. you know what proper communication. Yeah. Like, they hey, didn't believe in each other. They were questioning each other. That's what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Same arguments we had today. Yeah, it is. And in all reality, it's the <laughs> same mm-hmm. thing we have today because mm-hmm. we have different things that I, I think, and 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 I'm going to try to tie it into Black Push Newbie Corp, right? Um, I think it's important that we kind of talk about what Black Push is, what Newbie Corp is. We're at the base of who we are. We are a religious organization, right? You look at Newbie Corp over here, over there, over here. <laughs> you see a cross and an umbrella, and it's kind of interesting how we talk about covering today um, because we understand that everything that we do in life from a spiritual standpoint, we should be covered by something or someone bigger than ourselves, right? Um, and Black Push, on the other hand, is once again spiritual because of the fact that we understand that forgiveness doesn't just stop at where we see forgiveness at. Forgiveness stands way past that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, at the bulk of it, though, no matter who you are, no matter what you do, everybody's given a choice in life. And one of the things that I love so much about God is that God doesn't force anything upon us. He gives us choices in everything. The Bible says that there's no temptation given to man that God has not already given us a way out from, Right. Um, so if we decide that, hey, our bills are behind and we are going to trust God to pay the light bill or write a bad check just to get send us out another three days, that's your choice, right? Mm-hmm. And I've been there and I've made some of the wrong decisions mm-hmm. and I made some of the right ones. And some of the right ones, even though my lights had to go out for a few hours, like that thing worked itself out. And when it worked itself out, not only did it get paid, it got paid for two, three, four months down the line. You know what I'm saying? But once again, going back to Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, I think that once again, and you know what? Interestingly enough, this is funny because there's a book in the Bible, and I think it's Corinthians or Romans. Paul says that he prefers for a man not to be married because if a man is married to a woman, then he's more caught up in pleasing his wife, right? And he prefers for a woman not to be married to a man because if she's married to a man, then she is um, more caught up in pleasing her husband, right? But then he goes on to say, but if you can't abstain from the lust of the world, then you kind of get married to avoid that, right? Um and I think that perspective comes from the fact that for a man, for a good man, let's correct that, for a good man, right? If a man is good, he's going to do whatever it takes to try to please his wife. And sometimes even if it means him stepping outside of his comfort zone, sometimes it even means when he um, he know he shouldn't. It's funny because I was at a house one time where we were hosting men who had just been previously incarcerated, and a lot of them were drug offenders, right? And I asked the question, how did you get to be a drug offender? Like It was like, because you know, man... Man, my old lady, man, she was putting pressure on me. I had to go out and do something, right? I had to go out and do something because she wasn't, you know, she wasn't happy with me bringing seven fifty home a day, right? She needed more than seven fifty. She didn't. She wanted four thousand dollars coming into the household every day instead of three hundred and twenty five dollars coming into the household every day. So he worked hard in the wrong way um, to try to make sure he pleases his wife and pleases household. And I can see Adam being in that same predicament. Okay, the back that story you're talking about right there. Did she meet Buddy like that? Right, he chose her. Now, did yeah when when she met Buddy, did he have that going on, or and he stopped to do a because I know people, but we from matter of fact, because mm-hmm. you from Miami. Yeah, we in the street, they in the streets, and you meet a female, and she's that lifestyle. And once you change your life around, they all ain't gonna accept that. So when she met Buddy. Was he in a lifestyle of stop because he so got the, it like that? The question, and this is a, that's a very good point, actually, and I, it does lead to me a question. So, what do you do when you in that type of situation? For you guys, like for women, I want to hear from the women's perspective first. Then we'll jump over to the guy side. You met a guy, and you met him one way, right? You've evolved. Let's say you two were not. You were not. I mean, you knew God. You were okay with God. He was cool, right? Um, but you wasn't really. He wasn't something that was on the top of your agenda, right? Then you grow in your relationship with God. And now the guy who you grow in your relationship with God, where he was doing one thing before, you look at him differently. You see him differently. Like, mm, like uh-uh, I'm tired of you being at home while I'm at work. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was okay because when I didn't have that relationship with God, I didn't have his expectations for you. Mm-hmm. Now that I do have expectations for you, like, how do you guys convert over to, like, dealing with that? Like, is you follow what I'm saying? Does it make sense? Because Ari, you look at your faces. You know, I always say your faces throw me off, so I can't look at your face. Let's start with you, Tenora. Does it make sense? It does. Um, I think it should start off as a conversation about 
where they are individually, where they want to go. Um, and if that doesn't work, I mean, you're not married. And if you are going, you're building a relationship with Christ, um, and he's not, like, on the same path or trying to get there, God's going to have something better for you. So just trust him. Be okay to let go. But what if you are married to him? Well, then you got to pray for it. You just got to pray for it. Pray for it. All right. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm kind of, I have a different perspective just because I think that if you're that. Well, I got you guys to split perspectives this time. Well, yes. not def- necessarily split. <laughs> we but got one. I think it's important to, if someone is ne- not necessarily loves you enough, but if they see how something is so important to you, either they're going to be open enough to change it about themselves and want to maybe grow on that path with you and may not necessarily stay on that path together, but at least willing to explore that with you. Or, you know, they could just not be about it. You cannot communicate with it and just, like she said, let it go, pray on it. If it's for you, it's for you. If it's not, it's not. But that's on your own personal relationship with God and how are you able to listen to him and, and follow what he wants for you. Maybe that person was only supposed to be with you for that certain amount of time. Who knows? It could be many Mm. reasons, but, you know, if you're growing together, you're working towards something together. If you're not, then, you know, it's not meant for you and it'll, it'll work itself out. But God has a plan for everything. Sometimes he uses people to push you into the destiny you need, but doesn't mean that person's meant to stay on the next level you go to. What about you? Like, what would you do, Darren? I mean, like, I mean, you got a lot going on in your own life. You wrote a book, which I'm not going to get a title today. Um, you wrote a book, but I mean, you moved, you just moved it from Florida. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think it's really cool too, because these people, Darren and Ari works with me every single day. Like Ari deals with <laughs> communications. She reaches out to different churches. We deal with different events. I think you got an event coming up with, uh, paint and sip it's coming up at the end of the month mm-hmm. on the 27th, 27th. right? Mm-hmm. That's going to be hosted virtually, right? Mm-hmm. And in person. Virtually and in person. So, um, and you deal with our social media, right? You deal with every aspect of it. You're on Facebook, you're on Instagram, you're mm-hmm. on Twitter. So every time you see something that comes out from us, it's because of him. But <laughs> the what I want to say from that is that you have your own journey that you're going through. You write your own book. You have yeah. your own businesses that you got going on. You just moved here from um, the 850, which stretches yeah. all the way from what? Mid- Tallahassee. Tallahassee to Pensacola. Madison, yeah. where, where Ray Charles is from. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, all the way to Pensacola. So, I mean, I'm just saying, mm-hmm. like, um, you're going through your own journey. So, like, how – I know you've progressed, right? Mm-hmm. you progress from where you used to be, right? Um, how is it that, for you, the progression has been? And have you found yourself in relationships where you was like, oh, it was cool back then, the things we did, but now it's like I'm on a whole nother level kind of deal? Definitely. Um, that's my reason for being single now. Um, I ain't gonna get to no dating platforms. Um don't, don't, uh, but uh <laughs> I know, right? Is that a fire uh, hydrant? Yeah. No, I'm <laughs> so um yeah, I think it's just I have like as a writer, I know you you said you're a writer as well. We're always trying to come up with innovative ways to do things, creative ways to um formulate plans. So I have like very ubiquitous ubiquitous genius so i try and draw from a bunch of different areas and sometimes that gets really like you know it gets comp you know complicated so i think that was my hardest thing like uh, i try to find different ways to advance sometimes they go against faith um or they go against something that they learned growing up but um <clears throat> it's never nothing detrimental right but definitely it, it's definitely hard when you're trying to introduce different things like something simple as uh say like meditation and to a Christian, it's like meditation. It seems like something only Buddhist people do. And mm-hmm. it's like, nah, like Africans been doing it, East Indian, like everybody meditates. Everybody's been doing it for centuries. Um, so, yeah, it's just different ways of thinking that I might accommodate that the other person may not. So Yeah, and that's interesting because yeah. I think there's a verse in, the, verse in the Bible that says meditate upon the word day and night, right? Mm-hmm. So for me, I use meditation. And for me, but it I, it's, I guess it's in the context of what I meditate on, right? Exactly. So for me, I meditate on verses in the Bible. I meditate on promises in the Bible. But at the same time, meditation has been used for me to be time where God gives me guidance on things that I may not have guidance mm-hmm. on, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think personally from a person who, um, who's been in relationships before that the hardest type of relationship is to be in one where you're going this way and the other person's going this way. And it's like that tug of war, right? Exactly. Ultimately, one of you are going to be stronger. 
And I've learned in my own life, like when you're trying to go a spiritual journey, it's always stronger to play tug of war with somebody who's on a worldly journey. Why? Because the worldly journey for me and for us, we can touch that. We can see that. We can feel that. We know what that's like. Mm -hmm. But the spiritual journey, we're going off of what Hebrews 11 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. It's something that we're trying to push for something that sometimes we don't always see the end result of, right? And yeah. um, I think it was Tyler Perry in his last play, he said that there's a ris there's, there's a reason why the, um, why the um, rear view mirror is smaller than the than the front mirror, front window, right? Mm -hmm. Simply meaning that sometimes about things about our past are not meant for us to stay and linger on kind of deal. But it's always better for us to kind of look towards the future, even though we don't know what the future holds, kind of looking towards the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty interesting. Even starting off with like your perception of Adam and Eve, I, as much as I argue this point, I do believe both of them had a fault in it. You know what I'm saying? Because they didn't have a fault in it and God wouldn't have punished them. The Bible says that he's a righteous judge, right? He mm -hmm. punished everybody in the room. So obviously he found fault in everything that everybody did during that day. Um, he started with the serpent. Then he went to mm -hmm. the woman and he ended up with the, the man, right? Um, so I think that's pretty interesting. But I think it's pretty interesting to have the dialogue and hear from other perspectives as well because when we can have dialogues like this, people, you know, are not... Um, when we can have dialogues like this, I ain't gonna throw no shade <laughs> today. When we can, or, not now. <laughs> when we can have dialogues like this, um, I think it's important because, at, once again, at the core of everything that we do with Newbie Corp and Black Push, we are faith based, right? Mm -hmm. And we've had a lot of podcasts. We've talked to a lot of different people, talked about a lot of different issues, but we never really talked about different opinions on what is going on from a biblical standpoint. Um, and I'll say this: like as an associate pastor, the 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 church itself is not holding up to the standards in which the church was built for. And I'll say that to everybody. I don't care how you feel about it. I don't care who gets offended by it. When we have 10 churches on one block and there's still thousands of people homeless, there's a problem, right? Um, there's no power in that. I mean, if you believe in the Bible, if you understand anything about the Bible, when the day of Pentecost came, like everybody had what they needed because everybody was on one accord. Everybody was doing the same thing. When we can't even go to, when I can't put a church across the street from your church because you're worried about me coming into your territory, we got a problem in the, in the spiritual realm, right? Um, so we, you know, we're going to continue to talk about, that is even a social injustice issue. And that's something that we're going to continue to talk about and continue to push because as pastors, as leaders in the community, um, this is a shout out to you guys. We have to do better. We must do better. We must work together because it makes no sense for all of us to be working for the same goal but at the same time doing it on separate templates. Ain't that right, Ariel? Mm -hmm. Ariel knows because she's trying to call them. So I'm telling you, <laughs> um, she knows. And it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, so real quick, before we end up closing out this segment, because we do have another special guest that's coming on, which I'm kind of really excited about. Um, I am. I'm really excited about the next guest. Like, this is going to be so cool for me. <laughs> um, but real quick, does anybody, you know, from that point, like from a, from a spiritual point, anything that you would just want to share with people, Maybe something that's laid upon your heart. Maybe something that you're going through that may encourage somebody else. You just never know. That's related to the... <laughs> Whatever. Oh, just in general. Mm -mm. Stay focused. Um, Just the power of manifesting. And learning for your own self what that means for you. Everybody manifests differently for what works for them. Um, But just knowing the power of it. And just focusing on the positive, no matter how low you are in your life or how high up you feel, you know, manifesting is powerful. Our mouths are powerful. Um, and just being able to be diligent with that. That's all. And we're going to make sure, I'm going to make sure I get you in somebody's pulpit. That's, I'm talking, what you talking about? I, I see a women's group or something coming together. <laughs> you can teach it. What's up, Tenora? I don't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you guys again. We're going to um, take a break before we go into our next segment. What's that? So, yeah. So we're going to take a break before we go into our next segment, you guys. But stay tuned with us. We'll be back in about six minutes. Um, just stay tuned because we have an, a powerful organization that we are working with or will be working with soon in the state of Florida. And we have a representative from that organization that's going to join us via Zoom. So don't go anywhere because you don't want to miss the second half of the segment.
Hey everyone, it's Sean again. Have some really exciting news for you guys. So I want to tell you about two events we have coming up. They're coming up back to back. Our first event is our Community in Touch seminar on March 20th from 5 to 7 p.m. It'll be virtual. We'll have people like D.A. Brody. We'll have people like Judge Angela Brown. We'll have people like D.A. Patsy. We'll have people like Sheriff Craig Owens and so many other politicians. We have state representatives, state senators that will be on. And hopefully we'll have one of our U.S. senators on as well to answer your questions about what's going on in the community. But it doesn't stop there. The following day, we'll be at Create Light Ministry, 285 Merchants Drive in Dallas, Georgia, 30132, where we'll have a service at 12 o'clock and immediately after the service, if you want to come out and support, we'll be feeding over 200 people who are homeless. So join us for these two events as we get ready to kind of build our community better. To register for any of these events, you can go to our website at www.blackpush.org, or you can go to www.newbecorp.org, or find us on Facebook, and you can register for any one of these events or make a donation to these events. We look forward to your help. And remember, here at Newbie Corp, here at Black Push, here at Create Life Ministries, we're building better together. You guys have a blessed day. See you soon. Hey y'all, so we're back. We are back. And I'm extremely excited about the person I have on next. Like, yeah. So everybody who just to give our introduction, most people don't know. Hey, I love the background. Is that a real background? Yeah. <laughs> That's a filter. <laughs> uh, but the next person I have on, somebody is somebody who's I'm extremely close to. It is my mother, and I kind of had wanted to bring home because with Black Push and Push her like on Newbie Corp, Push cover Newbie Corp. Sorry, I wanted to kind of bring home because her story to me is amazing, and the things that she's been through is amazing. But more importantly, the things that she's doing now in Florida is amazing because most people don't know that some of the things we have going on in Florida, um, as far as Georgia voter suppression, um, people trying to hinder the rights of ex-offenders, is going on in Florida too, and she's playing a huge role in that in her new position. So, Ma, first off, kind of tell your story, like where you come from, how you got here, all that. Let's tell the people. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for asking um, me to come on, Sean. Like, um, I'm sitting here thinking that uh, my mother, your grandmother, is smiling in heaven right now. You know, um, man, I love you, and I'm so proud of you and the things that you're doing. Uh, just a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Fort Lauderdale. I'm, I'm an only child. My mother, mother had 16 children. Two died at birth, so she raised 14 children. So um, when my mother, she always told me, she made this vow that when she had children of her own, like the life that she wanted to give them, the life that she didn't have, uh, her mother couldn't afford to give her. Like she shared with me that she never even received uh, new clothes when she was a kid. Everything, she was like, I think number four, feels something like that, child. And it, all her clothes was hand me downs because she had two older sisters. And um, but one of the things that we laughed about is like, um, but my grandmother was firm. She was, you know, she she pushed you to be a, to be a, the best that you can be. You know, you couldn't come in her house and say, "Look, I'm not going back to school no more," and it'd be okay. Uh, you just did not uh, uh, try my grandmother like that. But by the time my mom had me, a lot of that stuff, she had re relaxed a lot of those rules, you know. Um, she gave me everything that she could give me, you know. Uh, I love her so much for that. But anyway, um, being an only child, my mom and my dad um, divorced when I was like eight years old, eight and a half, nine years old. And I can remember, like, I was so angry with my mom because I was a daddy's girl, you know. Um, my dad was a truck driver. And so he used to take me on rides for him, you know, and, like, I love my dad. And at that time, you know, you really didn't get Black parents, Black mothers that would tell you anything negative about your father. You know, um, she used to dress me up on Saturdays, and I used to sit in this big, picture frame window waiting for him to come and he wouldn't show up. And um, I, I tell that because I think that's where a lot of the stuff started for me at nine years old. I can remember feeling uh, like, why he don't love me? Did he want a boy? 
uh, what do I need to do? Is it the way I act? Is it because I'm too fat? All these kind of things I was wondering because that was where I, I first experienced, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, just not feeling good enough, abandonment. And it was it started at the age of nine with my dad and my mom divorced. So I went through life. Um, I hated being the only child. You know, uh, I have a video of my mom talking about like all the problems I gave her as a kid. Like I would try to, I would uh, try to take pills, swallow pins, all kind of stuff, just to try to. I didn't like being who I was, and I didn't like the fact that um, that I felt like my dad didn't love me anymore, and. So my grandmother moved in with my mom when I was at nine because my grandmother moved in to take care of me while my mother worked. And, you know, my grandmother kept all her grandchildren at that time. It was about 15 of us that she used to keep every day, you know. And um, I remember every day at 12 o'clock, she would make us get on our knees and pray. And uh, she instilled in us who God was. Uh, we went to church three days a week. Uh, my grandmother was, her, her faith was, she was uh, holiness, sanctified. <laughs> um, well, I, and I love my grandmother because she, she, she and my mother too, they both planted the seed. They let me know that there was a God who loved me in spite of anything. He loved me. So even when I went into the streets, I knew that God loved me. Um, but I also, again, felt like with God, the same way I felt about my dad, like I wasn't good enough, though. And so I went through life feeling like I had to get better and become a certain person before I was able to tap into to God, you know. And, um, you know, so anyway, uh, at the age of, I think, about 19, I started experimenting with drugs. Well, let me go back a little bit. At the age of 14, I experimented with a little with a boy. <laughs> and, you know, uh, back then, you, you know, you know, you just did not go to your parents and say, hey, look, I think I want to have sex. Can you uh give me some information? You know, we kind of you shared that kind of stuff with your friends who didn't know any any more than what you knew. So needless to say, I got to high school, my ninth grade year. I, you know, I, I love basketball and I made the basketball team. And when I had it, um, I got started feeling sick. To make a long story short, I was pregnant. And I couldn't understand how, because the only thing me and the little boy was doing was playing around. You know, today I know how, you know, back then I didn't know. So I was a teenage mother. My first son was born when I was 15. From that, at 19, um, like I said, I started experimenting with drugs, you know, and I tell these kids today, like, first it started out with alcohol for me. I remember, and I should have known then that something was kind of wrong with me. Uh, I remember taking my first drink, me and my cousin, and um, in that crowd, everybody had one beer, tall bull. I had to be, I had to drink the other five. And um, I remember being so sick. I mean, when I got home that night, I was throwing up everywhere. But that was that was the beginning. When I look back at my life now, I, um, how do I say it? Like, there was addiction in my, you know, the addiction runs through my family, for one. You know, and, um. But my mother didn't know enough to, to share with me like I share with my kids. I told them, I said, look, I'm an addict. And I want you to know if you can go out with 10 of your friends and try drugs, if there was one person that was probably going to be addicted, it would probably be you because I'm an addict. And, 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 and I do believe that some of this stuff could be heretic, uh, could be brought along through the bloodline. I really believe that. Uh, Anyway, so drugs kicked my butt, you know, for for 20 years. You know, I was, you know, I got, I started out with the alcohol and ended up a full-blown crack addict, you know. 
for like 20 years, I broke my mother's heart, you know, because that's not what she wanted for her child, her only child. My mother wanted me to graduate from high school, get married, <laughs> had a white picket fence and the children, and I did none of that. I dropped out of high school in my senior year because I always wanted to be grown first. You know, I, 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 you know, I wanted to be, I thought that uh, it was cool. I was all the man, I was attracted to the pimps, the players, the drug dealers because I liked money and flashy things. You know, and at that time, that's what I was attracted to. And um, so I ended up being a full-blown crack, crack addict for 20 years. In the midst of, of being a crack addict, I had two more children, which I had a total of three children. And um, I'm so grateful to my mother today because my mother, she stepped in and she raised my kids. And um, so they didn't have to experience going into foster care uh are being adopted and I love her for that. So 20 years of getting high back and forth, going in and out of jail. I went to prison twice. And I remember the first time I went to prison, it's like they had rescued me because I was smoking crack real bad. I was on the streets. And um and when I went, I didn't want to leave. I mean I feel like I had been rescued. And the second time I went to prison, I had, had I had been introduced to Narcotics Anonymous. Let me tell you that too. Narcotics Anonymous planted a seed in my life. One time I, I when I was 16, I um I called myself taking a bunch of pills and so I wanted my mother to feel sorry for me. And a lot of times that's how I thought I had to get my mother's attention by doing negative things like that. And I took a bunch of pills and I remember going to the hospital and the doctor asked the series of questions. And they asked me, had I ever drank that used drugs? And I had drank. So he convinced my mom that she needed to pay $30,000 to send me to a treatment center. And when I went to that treatment center, um, I was chill because, again, I'm, all, I'm, I was, I'm my only child. I hated being home because I hated being alone. I didn't like being by myself. So when I went into this treatment program, I was excited because it was, I was there with people, a bunch of people. I was the youngest one there though at that time. Like everybody was in their late 20s, 30s, 40s. And here I'm sitting in there and I'm saying to myself, like, how do you lose your whole life on alcohol, with alcohol and drugs? You know, I go back to that spot because, you know, when I first went into treatment, I hadn't even been introduced to the drug that really took me out. Right. I had just drained a little bit. But so when I went there, I took it as a playtime. Like when they were in group, I was in the kitchen eating or on the basketball court. I didn't take group seriously because I felt like none of that stuff applied to me. 30 years later, I realized that it applied to me back then because had I listened to the people talk about the feelings that they were, it wasn't about the drugs, it was about the feelings. And they were talking about the feelings of abandonment, a feeling of not wanting to be in your own skin, a feeling of having to drink so that they can even hold a conversation or having to use drugs, you know, just to feel comfortable. I could have identified with that then because like I said, I started feeling those feelings at nine. So well, anyways, so I was, I'm, I was, but I'm grateful that the seed was planted. The seed was planted, you know, and, um, 20 years in and out, in and out. I don't know, you know, I had a mother, a praying mother, you know, I have a video of my mom left me and she said, Pat, one thing you need to know is that you have a praying mother and, my, and your children have a praying grandmother. I pray all day and night and she did. And I'm so grateful for the prayers of my mother and my family. Because if it wasn't for the for those prayers, I don't, I, I don't, I know I wouldn't be here today, you know. Because even in the midst of me doing wrong, and I can remember times of using drugs and when I didn't even want to use them, but I was, I was addicted. And um, but I prayed anyway, you know. And uh, I'm so glad I did. Now getting, you know, like I said, I went to prison twice. And my last trip I went to prison, I had been clean for like a year and I relapsed and I went to prison. 
That second time, I was ready to get out. And I never forget what I said to a lot of my friends there. I said, look, I'm not coming back here no more. This is it for me. I had to have a taste of life that I could live a different life. And I, I, and I told him, I said, this is it. I'm not coming back. You know, uh, I was doing, running NA classes in the jail. All my friends used to laugh at me because, you know, that wasn't cool. But I didn't care about being cool. I was ready to get out and live a life because I had a taste, had a taste of that there was a real life right there for me and that I could live it. You know, and um I wanna say it's been 30 years since I've been arrested. You know, I have been arrested in 30 years, man. And um oh no. So um, but you know what? Though the thing that I used to think that drugs was the worst thing that could have happened to me. I don't feel like that today. It was probably one of the best things that could have happened to me because it made me the woman that I am today. You know, uh, it made me build my own personal relationship with God. You know, I couldn't ride out on my mother's relationship or my grandmother's relationship. I had to get to know God for myself and I'm grateful for that, you know? Uh, so, you know, I'm a proud member of Narcotics Anonymous still to this day. You know, I go to meetings, I work still, so I have a sponsor. And about, what, I would say about 18 years ago, I applied for this job. And, and one of my friends was working in a place that's called Broward House. And Broward House is an agency that caters to people who are HIV positive or have AIDS or at risk. And I remember going and getting a job there. And because another thing, HIV just ramshacked my family. I lost so many people to in my family to HIV, you know, and um the one that 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 touched me the most though, I remember I was in Memphis, Tennessee, because that's where my dad lived at. I think he him and my mom broke up. And my dad, I could see that like, something was wrong with him because he he was real frail and not the man who I had, you know, had known all my life. And he shared with me, he said, uh, Pat, I haven't told anybody, but I'm gonna tell you. And um, he told me that he had AIDS. And I never knew, I said, well, why you wanna tell? Cause I had a sister that he has a daughter that's older than me. Why didn't you tell her? Like, why did you put this on me? And he. My dad told me at that time, he said that he felt like I was one of his, the strongest child, one of his stronger kids. And, um, but here it is, I'm walking into this door to work with people who are HIV positive. And about two weeks of working there and working in the community, I went into my boss office and I said to him, I said, James, I, what, I see women, black women out here are dying and nobody's doing anything about it. You know, all of the funding is going to, to white gay men, but it, it's not a, just a white gay man's disease. It's a disease that anyone can get, you know? And right now it's, it's, it's devastating the black community, but you guys don't have any programs, especially when it comes to women. Black women are getting infected 17 times higher than white women in the state of Florida. Miami, in, in Fort Lauderdale, which is Broward County, we run back to back. One week, uh, they has the most cases and new infections, and then Broward will have it the following week. And the one of the zip codes that was the highest in the state of Florida in Broward County was 33311. And that was the zip code that I grew up in, I worked in, I worshiped in, I played in, and I was just not okay. With knowing that, you know, hey, this my community is dying and nobody is doing anything about it. And, you know, I love my boss, man. This guy, he encouraged me. He was like, Patricia, get your computer, come on. And he, I went into his office and we went on the CDC website and we found a program called SISTA. And SISTA is Sisters Informing Sisters on the topic of HIV and AIDS. And I love that. I love that program. And one of the things that I loved about sister, when I went to the training to be a trainer, you know, I was looking for us to go through all this, you know, um, you know, like book work. And before we got started with the book work, they made us 
we had to talk about us. That's when they, they told us that, you know, in order to help someone else, you have to work on a lot of your own pain. And man, I was in this class with women who were doctors and people were boo-hoo crying. I mean, they scared me at first because it was too real and I didn't know if I wanted to feel that at work. But that was one of the best things that happened to me. That, that I think that was the turning point in my life, you know, because um, it made me be real. It made me take a real look at Pat along with NA because NA does the same thing. But um, And I, I'm going to jump in, right? Because I wanted to, we got like nine minutes left and I want to talk about what you're currently doing, right? Um, but throw this out there too. I throw this out there too. At this point, you you pass the GED phase, you pass your bachelor's phase, which I remember going to that um, graduation ceremony, and you pass your master's stage, right? So that's yeah. a kudos too. So I mean, one of the things that we like to talk about on Black Push is that we not only like to talk about the things that we're currently doing in the community, we like to talk about the people who have become success stories, right? My mom, a guy named Ricky Mims, who um, went from working, from being in prison for over 20 years to working for Kwanzaa Hall as, as at the U.S. House of Representatives, right? Um, even it, I think there's even a picture of you on a T-shirt with Obama's arm around you, right? When he was down in Fort Lauderdale um, doing yeah. an event. And I remember one of the biggest moments for me, per se, um, and I think I called you afterwards when I was sitting at a stop yeah. sign on, some, on um, I think it was Atlantic, whatever I was at. I was sitting at a stop sign, and I looked over at a bus, and I went like this, and I was like, dang, that lady looks like my mama. And I went back to driving, and I was like, and I looked back over at the bus, and I was like, dang, that is my mama. And her face was like plastered on like 20 buses down in Broward County. But I know you work for Florida Rising now. Tell us what Florida Rising is. What are some of the things that you guys are doing down there? Yeah. So after 15 years of working with the HIV arena, uh, God brought me to work with a political organization. And what I loved about this political organization that made me want to stay, because this is an organization that I don't have to hide when I just say that we work with uh, helping black and brown folks. Florida Rising we used to be formerly a uh, new Florida majority. Uh, now I am the criminal justice organizer for the state of Florida. And what made me really want to get into criminal justice because criminal justice is me. You know, I can remember uh, when Obama got elected the second round, I had voted for all those years that I was out of prison. Mm -hmm. And I was a productive member paying taxes. And they sent me a nice little letter that said, hey, look, you cannot, you can no longer vote. You, know, you have not restored your rights. And I'm like, what are they talking about? So I went to, uh, to one of my friends who was a commissioner at that time. And we looked it up, you know, they, they said I had like $1,200 in fines and fees. And um, I was like, wow. So last year, Florida majority, along with uh, FRRC and Dream Defenders, they, we decided to push a bill that will allow uh, ex-felons to vote. Mm -hmm. Because there was a lot of ex-felons that, that wanted to vote and we could not vote. And they fought it, they followed us back and forth with it. They passed it, then they said, Well, if you still owe fine and fees, you can't vote. And then uh organizations like New Florida, Florida Rising, Dream Defenders, FRRC, and other organizations got together and they paid fines and fees for a lot of ex felons. So last year I was able to vote again. And uh this year, you know, right now we're in session right now in, in Tallahassee. We are working on a bill, this HB1 bill, where our great governor decided that he wants to criminalize people for peaceful protest. Oh, wow. And, yeah, yeah. And we know that that's something that attacks black and brown folks. You know, I was, I, you know, my question is, where was that bill when they was at the Capitol when they did all the work, all this stuff they did at the Capitol? Oh, my computer for that. Yeah, I hope it'll go out. So, yes, that's what I do. Uh, and we just, we got a bill passed called the Tammy Jackson Act. We, ha we had a young lady who had mental health issues in the county jail. She was pregnant when she went in. She was in her last trimester. They put her in solitary confinement. The young lady screamed and yelled and cried out for seven hours. None of the deputies would open the door. By the time they decided to open the door, the young lady had had the baby on the cold floor and was eating on the umbilical cord. So we got to act 
we got a law passed and we're and they're actually trying to uh try to throw some you know some shady stuff in it but uh we got a law passed that we they cannot put pregnant women in solitary confinement and we're trying to you know we're, we're trying to get a, one of our prisons in florida closed down but yeah uh i am so excited about the new position and like I'll, another thing i'm trying to do is like if you've gone to prison and you've done your time you come out you're paying tax and you're a productive member of society take the stamp off our heads because right. i was able to go into the jail and teach classes for 10 years However, when it came time to apply for a job there, they would not let me have a job because of a charge that was 32 years old. Oh, wow. And so that's the piece of legislation I'm going to pick up because that that affects a lot of people. You know, so, Sean, I am so grateful. I love what you're doing. Like I said, you're going to have to help me get this podcast thing set up in, uh, with Florida Rising because I would love to have conversations like this with my community uh, in Florida on a Saturday afternoon. Thank you all so much. And it was nice mm-hmm. meeting you. And, and Sean, real quick, going. and real Thank quick though, just so people know, if they want to go look up Florida Rising and more information about it, you guys have a website on the ceiling. Yes, it's floridarising.org. .org. So floridarising.org. And the reason why I wanted to have my mom on, not only because I feel like she's awesome and her story is awesome, I also just feel like a lot of things that's going on in Florida, as we know, are going on in Georgia. Ari, you had the opportunity to go with us last week to do your protesting. Um, We were protesting in Georgia a bill called HB 531, where they were trying to restrict the way we're able to vote, uh, limit the way we're able to do absentee ballots. And that bill did pass the House. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, we have to understand here in Georgia, just because it passed the House does not mean that it's over with, right? We still still has to go through the Senate. Um, we there still has to go to committees to be voted on. So we need everybody out there, whether you're in Florida, whether you're in Georgia. The biggest voice you have is your voice to vote. And definitely for us offenders, when they take away that voice, then that makes the criminal justice system not obligated to giving to being responsible for us, if that makes sense. Um, to giving us the right to vote, to giving us the right. You know, it's funny because um I realized that too, and here in Georgia, you get the right to vote once you have served your time, right? Mm-hmm. If a judge looks at you and they want to be judged for another 20 years, they don't look at you as now like somebody who they can put away for 20 years on a five-year crime, right? Because they know that at the end of five years, you automatically get your rights restored back. So they look at you differently. In Florida, that was not the case until like two years ago when they passed the legislation. And then the governor decided that, hey, you know what? Y'all don't know what you're talking about. So we're going to adjust it and make it right. When the bill was real clear, it was that once a person served their time back, they get their rights to be restored back. So I, I want to encourage you guys, definitely in Florida, thanks to having my mom on. In Georgia, pay attention to what policy is going on in your state. Um, and I encourage everybody right now, if we want to stop a lot of the voter suppression things that's going on, we can stop it without even having to deal with our state. If we can push the people in, the, um, in Congress and in the Senate, to pass HB1, to pass HB3, and to pass um, other legislation that will prohibit the states from being able to even do this, from gerrymandering, from being able to stop absentee voting, because the bill they just passed in the House right now would automatically register everybody to vote, including ex-offenders, if they served their time. Um, will automatically do it, and the state will have nothing that they can do except for taking it to the Supreme Court. But by that time, Supreme Court, is to, their job is to what, interpret law. It'll be law, right? So... We have to be more encouraged. We have to be a part of the policy discussion that's going on. But I do want to thank everybody who participated today. I know this is a little different talking about Adam and Eve at Ari and Tenora, but I think it was a good discussion about the spirituality of it. Um, And just talking in general with my mom about what they're doing at Florida. Is it Florida organizing? Florida? Florida, help me. Florida Rising. I'm sorry. Rising. Rising. FloridaRising.org. Florida Rising. Look at us. Yeah, floridarising.org. And congratulations for your new position as the... Say it again. I just like you said it. <laughs> I'm the criminal justice organizer for the state of Florida. For the state of Florida, man. And I, I'm just trying to get through Atlanta. Um, so that's Florida's a big, big task. State. And we, we, we want to support that as much as possible. But everybody, thank you for joining on to our podcast. I want to encourage everybody to check out www.blackpush.org. 
We have a whole bunch of events coming up. We have a paint and sip coming up on the 27th of this month. Before that, we have a community event where we're having politicians from around the state who will be on Zoom and they'll be answering questions from the community. That's on March 20th from 5 to 7. And the following day on March 21st, we'll be doing a homeless feeding at Created Light Ministries where we'll have church service from 12 to 2. And after that, we'll feed anybody in the community who who wants a meal. Um, We'll be doing that from 2 to 4. And we have a whole bunch of more events coming up. We have a bingo night coming up that's virtual. We have um, a wine tasting that's coming up that's going to be virtual. We have a whole bunch coming up, and we want you guys to be a part of it. And we want you guys to notice, too, from Black Push's perspective and from Newbie Corp, we will not stop pushing. We're out here pushing every day. We want to meet with every representative in the state of Georgia. I don't care whether you you have a D next to your name or R next to your name. We want to hold hold the conversation with you. And we are encouraged. And we call out Governor Brian Kemp. You got our request for a meeting. We're waiting on your response. I'm looking for that response, right? Because I feel like as elected officials, no one should hide behind the door or hide behind the security. It's your obligation to speak to the constituents in which you serve. And I'm a constituent of the state of Georgia. Um, So we just want to challenge everybody. And at the end of this, it's all about building better together. We'll see you guys next week when we'll have on Royal Roy. Um, and she'll be here talking about Paulding. And our next week host will be Darren and Ari. So we're going to give it up to them. Um, they'll be here next week with <laughs> Royal Roy. And um, we just want to thank, again, Disco 100 for everything that you do, man, and for everything that you're trying to do. And I want you guys to go to our website as well because we're going to be posting some things about um, a man's, a basket, a football team that he has, and he needs donations as well. So you can donate through our website, and that money will go directly to him. Um, and the organization. I mean, but your organization, it go to the kids. <laughs> Clarify that. It will go to the kids. But we're going to continue to partner with Disco 100, Cobb County Police Department, um, Cobb Sheriff's Office, and everybody else. And Paulding County Police Department, we're also working with. So thank you guys for joining us this week. Um, continue to follow us on our websites, on the different websites we've had. And remember, you guys, we can do this a whole lot better when we build better together. You guys have a blessed day.